Welcome everyone, it's 801, and I'm super happy to be here again for Grand Rounds. And uh, my meteorological event is last weekend, I waited all weekend for the snowstorm, canceled a dinner party on Saturday night, and then we all just had to laugh because it never really snowed. <laughs> So maybe we'll get some snow this weekend. Um, with that, I am very honored uh, today to be uh, presenting our Grand Rounds speaker, Dr. Melissa DiTallo, entitled House Call, Home-Based Primary Care in Research and Practice. Dr. DiTallo is an assistant professor on the CHS track here who joined us in 2016. She's in the Division of Geriatrics uh, in our Department of Medicine here. So just to tell you a little bit about Dr. DiTallo uh, and her trajectory as far as how she's gotten to where she is today, she did her uh, medical degree at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore. She also did an MPH at that time as well. She then did her residency in general internal medicine track in an internal medicine residency at Johns Hopkins at the Bayview Medical Center. And following her residency, she was the assistant chief of service, which was the equivalent of a chief resident there. We were very lucky that we have a fantastic geriatric fellowship, and she came here for her fellowship following her residency. And she then also went ahead and did a VA advanced fellowship in older women's health. And during that time received a certificate program in clinical and community outcomes research here at University of Wisconsin as well. She uh, very early in her career holds several leadership positions. Uh, she is currently the director of the GEM clinic at the VA and GEM stands for the Geriatric Evaluation and Management Clinic. And she, along uh, with Steve Barzi um, and preliminary Dr. Del Tallo, Tallo has, um, I've watched her develop the home-based um, primary care program here at UW Health uh, through our systems of population health, and she is currently the director of that program. She's received several prestigious awards. Just this past year in 2019, she received the UW Health Leadership Rising Star Award. In 2018, she received the Atlantic Philanthropies and the John A. Hartford Foundation Practice Change Leader for Aging and Health. And in 2015 and 16, she was in the presidential poster session at the American Geriatric Society annual meeting. Uh, so I have had the pleasure of being able to work with Dr. Detallo uh, during her time here, and she is someone who is a builder of programs. She has a vision, um, and not only is she a builder and does she have a vision, but she knows how to go through the steps to work with an institution to have a program of very significant magnitude um, institutionalized. Dr. Barzi's in the audience has been significantly helpful with that as well. But I'll say that this program, she waited patiently. Um, she was told it was a fantastic program, but there wasn't funding. So she waited for one or two more funding cycles and then got the program. And we're gonna hear about part of that today. So Dr. Natalo, please come forward. Um, thank you so much, Betsy. It's really um, an honor to be here today and have the opportunity to talk to you about home-based primary care. Um, we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, I do have some audience response questions in this presentation, so if you have your cell phones out, um, you may have used this uh, software program called Poll Everywhere before. And what it does is it allows you, there's instructions at the top of the screen to connect with your cell phone or your laptop if you have a laptop, and then be able to answer the questions on your phone and in real time we can see the responses. So if you um, have your cell phone and you're able to text to this number 37607, and then in the body of the text, type in the code UWJERRY971. Um, if you do that correctly, you should get a confirmation message that you're connected. And then this is a test question. Um, it says, what is your favorite time of year in Madison? And once you're connected, uh, again, by typing that code in to the number 37607, then you'll be able to answer the question just by texting A, B, C, or D. 
So I'll give you a minute to get connected, and um, if you're able to connect now, it will make the rest of the presentation go a lot smoother with the other questions that we have. Looks like a lot of people love summer in Madison. Only about 4% now, 8% enjoying winter. All right, it looks like um, a lot of people have been able to get connected. Um, and if you haven't been connected yet, you'll have another opportunity when the next questions comes up. But it looks like summer wins, um, which I, I agree. I love summer here in Madison. So I have no uh, financial relationships to disclose. And I wanted to start off um, by sharing with you why home-based primary care is important to me. And this is a picture of me in high school. I grew up living with my grandparents. My mom was the primary caregiver, taking care of them and also raising me and my sister. And um, my grandma and grandpa actually had very different paths in the health system, especially in their last year of life. My grandma had multiple hospitalizations. She experienced pretty much every uh, complication in the healthcare system that you might imagine an older adult could experience. And this kind of culminated in her being resuscitated against her advanced directives um, due to a failed transition of care. And this left my mom in the difficult position to decide whether or not to withdraw the ventilator. Um, my grandpa, too, had his share of challenges in the health system, but had a lot of bright spots. And one of those bright spots was a house call physician who he was able to get connected with and really was the first healthcare provider um, to put a lot of time and effort into understanding what was important to him, what was important to our family, and um, was able to get us connected with hospice at the right time so that my grandpa was able to have a very peaceful death at home. And I know a lot of you in this room um, are aware of the importance of home-based medical care and have even been involved in all of the program development that's happened over the past three years here at UW. And so before I wanted to um, get into the full content of the talk, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you all because everyone who's contributed past, present, and future um, has helped me fill a promise to my grandparents, which was to make the healthcare system a better place than what they experienced. So in the spirit of health systems improvement, I hope you'll be able to walk away from today's talk being able to do these three things. Identify the patient population most likely to benefit from home-based primary care. Describe the impact of home-based primary care and population health outcomes. Understand the role of physicians and advanced practice providers in delivering home-based medical care in partnership with teams. And so in order to accomplish these goals, I'm gonna give an overview of home-based primary care in both research and practice. We'll review the evidence about who has the most potential to benefit from this care model, what's the actual impact it can have on outcomes, and then what are the core components of effective programs. And then we'll save the last 10 or 15 minutes to talk about home-based primary care in practice and what that looks like here at UW. Um, I think a lot of the primary care providers in this audience may be aware of UW's home-based primary care program or may have even referred patients. Um, but I do wanna also um, say if you're a hospitalist or a subspecialist, sub you're gonna be start seeing um, more patients that we're taking care of at home. The patients that we're seeing um, for the new patient intake visits have a lot of complicated conditions and it may not surprise you that they're having an equally hard time coming into their specialist appointments as they are coming in for their primary care appointments. So thinking about your own practice, let's first go over who has the most potential to benefit from home-based primary care. And to do that, I'd like to introduce you to Evelyn. Evelyn's the very first patient who I started seeing at home as a UW faculty member when I started in 2016. And this is not her real name, it's not her real picture, but she's a real person. When I met her, she was 96 years old. She ha had low vision, she's legally blind, multiple pulmonary emboli on new anticoagulation, and she had new onset right heart failure. And at the time she was living with her chronically ill son, the last time that she stepped foot into a UW clinic was in 2014. And then between 2014 and 2016, she had multiple emergency room visits. Uh, mostly for hypertensive urgency, and then in 2016 she had two hospital stays, each with a subacute nursing home rehab stay afterwards. And that's actually where I met her. Um, I was seeing her on behalf of a colleague in the nursing home and talking to her about going home. And she told me she had no intention of seeing her primary care doctor for her post-discharge follow-up appointment, 
it was too hard for her to get to clinic. So I offered to start seeing her for her primary care visits at home, and she agreed. So since 2016, um, she has had 21 home visits, actually 22. I just saw her yesterday, and I told her about the talk today and asked her if there's anything she wanted to share, um, which I'll tell you in a minute. And so she's 100 years old now. Um, she lives alone. She's uh, unfortunately outlived her son, and she's not had any hospitalizations or emergency room visits um, in the past three years. And um, what she wanted to tell you was that, um, you know, she appreciates all the medical care we've been giving her, but what's been most important um, in order for her to continue living at home has actually been the home and community supports that we've connected her with. So um, particularly the grocery delivery, Meals on Wheels, and um, she had an in-home low vision rehab consult from the Madison Council for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and they were able to get her connected um, with this audiobook delivery service from the National Library of Congress, which she listens to all day long. Uh, so Evelyn is not alone. There's actually two million Medicare members living in the community who are completely or mostly homebound. And that's a pretty big number, 5.6% of the Medicare population. And if you compare that to the number of Americans living in nursing homes, um, it's actually larger. So there's 1.4 million Medicare members living in nursing homes in the US. And if you live in a nursing home, um, you're actually required to see a primary care provider every 60 days. But those living at home with similar health problems um, may not be seeing their doctors at all or may only be seeing them on days when they're feeling well enough to leave the house. So one way to think about the population with the most potential to benefit from home-based primary care is those who are nursing home eligible but who choose to remain living in the community. And what does it mean to be nursing home eligible? I'll be using that term um, throughout this talk, so I just wanted to define it. And generally, someone's considered nursing home eligible if they need assistance with two or more of these activities of daily living. So those are listed here, um, functional mobility, bathing, dressing, toileting, continence, and feeding. And I put a picture of a lift on this slide. Um, if you've been very often in nursing homes, these are very common in nursing homes to help people with mobility impairments transfer in and out of bed or in and out of uh, wheelchairs. And um, I do just wanna point out that there are several patients I see at home who also have lifts at home and their caregivers have learned how to use them um, and they do very well with that setup. So going back to Evelyn, um, when I met her at the nursing home, she uh, newly required assistance uh, with bathing. That was not something that she needed prior to her hospitalization. And it's very common, it's one of the most common risk factors for new onset disability in older adults is having a hospitalization. So the first audience response question, um, which we'll uh, get to on the next slide when you can enter your answers, is after a new onset disability, what percentage of older adults have recovered function after two years? So, um, great, showed up correctly. So <clears throat> if you're already connected, you can just type in your answer, A, B, or C. And if you're not connected yet, um, the instructions are at the top of the screen. All right, it looks like most people think the answer is C, 22.1%. Um, and your answer is correct. So um, that's actually the right answer. Only 22.1% of older adults will recover to their previous level of function after a new onset disability. And um, we know this uh, from actually a study that just came out in 2019 from the Health and Retirement Study looking at people who were over the age of 65 and the natural history of their disability, what happened to them. So this is a really neat graphic, um, just to orient you a little bit. The x-axis here is um, time. So this is time zero. This is the time of their new onset disability in one of those activities of daily living. So prior to that, they were independent in function. And then it goes out 10 years um, that they were followed. And then the y-axis is the percentage um, of older adults in each of these different trajectories. And each color represents a different trajectory. So um, if you answer 22.1%, um, that's the right answer in terms of the number of people who've had a new onset disability and are able to recover at two years. 
Unfortunately, the most common outcome um, is actually mortality. So 46.8% of participants um, had died by two years of follow-up. And then the next most common outcome is persistent disability. So 31.1% of the participants were still living but had not recovered their function at two years. And those different colors of categories within that 31% represent different caregiving situations. So paid caregivers, unpaid caregivers, um, no caregivers managing on their own. But what I wanna call your attention to is this um, light blue uh, sliver here. And those are the people living in nursing homes. So what this study tells us is that a large portion of Medicare patients out there are developing disabilities, not getting better, and also not moving to nursing homes. So if they're living at home and physicians are not coming to them um, like they do in nursing homes, how are they accessing um, primary care? Or um, are they using a disproportionate amount of care in emergency rooms and hospitals? So a population study from Medicare actually um, suggests the latter. Medicare's been running a demonstration project since 2012 that has helped us learn a lot more about this hidden population. And this demonstration project is called Independence at Home. It's testing a team-based longitudinal primary care model in the home. And um, they're really interested in this nursing home eligible population who's living in the community and enable to identify that population from Medicare claims data. Um, this is how they defined it. The eligibility criteria to participate in the Independence at Home Demonstration Project included having two or more chronic conditions, two or more impairments in activities of daily living, and then um, additionally, they required at least one hospitalization with a post-acute care episode in the previous year. So that means they were hospitalized and either went to a nursing home for subacute rehab or um, went home with home health. And if you take this eligibility criteria and apply it nationally to Medicare data, it identifies a very small portion of Medicare patients, only 6.6%. Um, but that 6.6% accounts for a disproportionate amount of healthcare utilization. So those small number of Medicare patients actually account for 27% of all Medicare spending, 25% of hospital admissions, almost half of all hospital readmissions, 24% of deaths, and 39% of patients newly admitted to long-term care facilities. So this is a small population, um, but a very consequential population um, for society. And so can home-based primary care actually help them Based on the demonstration project, um, the answer is yes. So this is a sneak peek at the outcomes data that we'll go over. But um, basically, the demonstration project itself has saved Medicare millions of dollars each year that it's been running. That was national data, though. What about here at UW? Um, do we also have patients who would have qualified for this demonstration project? We we're actually able to look at this using Medicare claims data from our own shared savings program here at UW. And we took that independence at home eligibility criteria, applied it to um, the claims data we had for our Medicare patients here at UW. And this identified patients represented in this red circle here. So these are area proportional Venn diagrams. Um, this criteria in the red circle identifies a little over 1,000 patients here at UW who have over $53,000 um, per member per year in healthcare costs. And that's um, quite a bit compared to the average UW Medicare patient who has about $9,000 per member per year in healthcare costs. And there's a substantial amount of overlap between um, this group that was identified and people in the top 5% of healthcare costs at UW between 2014 and 2016. And the other thing I wanted to point out about our local population here is that um, this population is not necessarily at end of life. So there's only about 25% overlap between them and people who died within those two years, um, which is consistent with the national data as well. Um, so these are patients who you know, have high costs, have high needs, and are continue, um, going to continue to have high needs um, year after year. And I realize I'm talking a lot about healthcare costs. Um, why do I care about them? So as a clinician, what this means to me is that there are probably unmet needs in this population um, and that we need to think better about ways to serve them. And that's the next question. So what impact can we have? What impact can home-based primary care actually have on this population? And that brings us to our next audience response question. Um, <clears throat> so based on the evidence, 
what are the expected benefits of home-based primary care for someone like Evelyn, um, who would have met that criteria for independence at home? And there's actually multiple right answers here. You can submit three answers. So pick your top three favorite answers. Your options here are A, longer life, B, fewer hospitalizations, C, improved physical functioning, D, reduced caregiver strain, and E, lower chance of long-term care placement. Uh, so again, you can pick multiple answers, uh, so you can pick up to three. Okay, it looks like, uh, let's see, the most popular answers here, fewer hospitalizations, the majority think that, reduced caregiver strain, and then um, number three here is longer life. So um, the evidence actually supports um, fewer hospitalizations, reduced caregiver strain, and um, lower chance of long-term care placement. Um, mortality rates are actually very similar between people receiving home-based primary care and people not receiving home-based primary care, and um, there's not very much evidence that this model can improve physical function. There's a lot of reasons um, why we think you know, home-based primary care theoretically could help people not only does it increase access to care, but there um, are some studies that it may have some advantages. So there's a really old study now from 1989 um, that's widely cited where people um, who received home visits had 1.7 on average more problems identified at their home visit compared to a comprehensive office-based assessment. And you can imagine, um, you know, maybe learning a lot more, being able to observe someone's function in the context of their home environment, having the privilege of being invited into someone's home um, is a good opportunity to build trust and understanding of values. And you may be interacting with caregivers who aren't coming to clinic appointments. It's also a great opportunity to enhance interprofessional communication. I've had uh, family meetings with hospice nurses, been able to examine wounds with um, home health nurses, and uh, have had the opportunity to interact with a lot of home and community-based healthcare team members who I wouldn't otherwise have seen in the clinic. So what outcomes do the research studies support? The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality um, actually did a comparative effectiveness review of home-based primary care studies in 2016. And um, they specifically were looking at interventions um, targeted towards older adults, not necessarily older adults, but any adults with chronic conditions, meaning there's a whole separate body of literature about maternal and child health home visits. And then they were looking at three health outcomes, um, the clinical outcomes itself, patient and caregiver experience, and utilization and costs. And this is the definition that they used to narrow down the literature. So in the end, they ended up with 19 studies that met their inclusion criteria. They tried to keep this definition pretty broad. Um, number one, it required visits by a primary care provider. And most of the studies had additional team members, but um, for example, this is, excludes home health agency literature because while they have really great teams, um, their mission isn't primary care. Uh, number two, it required visits to a patient's home. So this excludes a lot of telephone-based interventions or pure telemedicine interventions. Number three, um, it required longitudinal management. So this means you know, other really important care models um, like transitional care or hospital at home weren't included in this study. And four, um, it needed to be comprehensive primary care. So this meant that the people delivering the intervention had to take full responsibility for the comprehensive care needs of the patients and um, it couldn't be just an add-on to their office-based primary care. So uh, they really uh, were able to have a pretty um, good definition of home-based primary care specifically, and their major findings included consistent evidence that there were fewer hospitalizations, fewer emergency room visits, and actually fewer specialty visits, all resulting in lower costs for the home-based primary care interventions. There was no difference in physical function um, and no difference in mortality. They also found very consistent evidence of improved patient and caregiver experience um, as measured by quality of life, satisfaction, and reduced unmet caregiver needs. 
Um, there's been one uh, other important study that's come out since that literature review was published, and this was actually from um, uh, the Independence at Home Demonstration Project sites, where they looked at long-term care placement rates. And they compared um, patients receiving home-based primary care through those demonstration project sites to Medicare patients nationally, and found that those receiving home-based primary care had half the risk of um, long-term nursing home placement. And again, mortality was similar between the two groups. So we know home-based primary care can improve outcomes. What about costs? The most cost-effectiveness data and earliest cost-effectiveness data has actually come from the VA. And you know, today we're talking about home-based primary care like it's new and innovative. Um, it was actually the most, 40% um, uh, of healthcare in the 1930s was done in the home. And the VA has had home-based primary care since the 1980s. So um, it's really the standard of care for veterans whose needs are not being well met in traditional office settings. And this table represents um, two studies combined that came out of the VA that were pre-post studies that showed uh, healthcare costs and utilization before and after enrollment in home-based primary care. And they showed reduced hospital days, reduced nursing home days, um, an increase in home care visits as might be expected. And that resulted in a total overall net decrease in um, cost for the VA of 24%. And then what I want to point out um, in the last row there, most veterans um, have their VA benefits and also have Medicare benefits. And um, what this showed in the second study was that not only is the VA home-based primary care program saving the VA money, it's actually also reducing Medicare costs for those veterans by 11%. So those were pre-post studies. Um, they have a lot of limitations. Um, there was another study published in 2014 in Medicare patients that had a very robust um, control group. This was a case cohort study of patients receiving home-based primary care um, from uh, one of the model home-based primary care programs in Washington, D.C., which is actually now part of the Independence at Home Demonstration Project and one of their most successful sites. So um, this was separate from the demonstration project, this analysis. And they had um, 722 patients they looked at who had received home-based primary care, again, comparing them to um, controls from national Medicare data. And what they found um, was that the patients receiving home-based primary care actually had higher hospice and higher home health costs, but lower physician um, skilled nursing facility and hospitalization costs, resulting in an overall um, decrease in um, total Medicare costs. And the last thing I wanted to point about, the, about this study is that they did a subgroup analysis based on level of frailty. So they used something called the Gen Frailty Index, which um, put people into categories of low, medium, or high frailty. And what's important to know about the Gen Frailty Index is that a score of seven or higher is essentially equivalent um, to that nursing home eligible group. So it's equivalent to having two or more impairments in activities of daily living. And um, they found that the cost difference was only significant for this most frail subgroup, which showed a 24% reduction in total Medicare costs. So this really reinforces the importance of, of matching the right care with the right patients at the right time and in the right place. So um, now that we have reviewed some evidence that this intervention works and who it works for, what are the core components of effective programs? So that same um, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality Literature Review also asked this question. They wanted to know how factors such as patient characteristics, organization, and intervention characteristics affected these outcomes that we've talked about before. And they um, did find uh, consistent evidence that frail older adults were most likely to benefit in terms of patient characteristics, but there were very few studies um, that even described any organizational characteristics and um, all of those 19 studies actually had different interventions. So um, there was not a lot of um, solid conclusions they can draw for, from um, that review from what's published in the literature, but there were um, kind of three conclusions they were able to come to. So the first was that there's wide variation in all of the different home-based primary care interventions they studied, but there were some common themes. And the common themes of the programs that were effective included some um, comprehensive assessment and care coordination. 
And then also critically important is that they all included team members in addition to the primary care provider. So this isn't you know one lone provider going out and um, doing these visits. It really took a team to accomplish these outcomes. And um, to take a moment to think about um, teamwork and the roles of different team members in the home, um, we can go back to Evelyn. So you explain the benefits of home-based primary care to Evelyn. And um, you know, think of yourself in this scenario as a primary care physician. As a physician, um, what's the best reason for a physician to make a house call? So your options are um, A, perform in-home medication reconciliation, B, evaluate home safety, C, improve access to medical care, or D, monitor vital signs, weights, and blood glucose. Okay, it looks like a lot of people have their answers in, and um, the most popular answer here is improve access to medical care, which um, is the best answer, and the reason being, you know, all of these things are important. All of these things you would wanna do for Evelyn, but um, the physician may not be the best person to complete each of these tasks. So for example, a home health nurse may be the best person to do the medication reconciliation in the home to monitor the vital signs and weights. Um, occupational therapist is probably the best trained person to do the home safety evaluation. And um, the VA has recognized the importance of team-based model to home-based primary care since the beginning. And this list of interdisciplinary team members actually comes from um, the VA Home-Based Primary Care Handbook, and these are nine different uh, roles on the team that are required for every home-based primary care program in the VA. And um, <clears throat> this is really, outside of the VA, considered the gold standard of teamwork um, for other programs outside of the VA that can't invest in this level of staffing. Um, they're very envious of the VA's teams. And this includes uh, physician, nurses, advanced practice providers, um, rehab therapists, dietitians, pharmacists, mental health providers, and medical support assistants. Um, one thing to note, though, is that even if you don't have access to a team like this um, and you're working outside of the VA, your patients still have access to many of these disciplines through Medicare skilled home health agencies. And um, this is a list, a summary of some of the most common roles and responsibilities um, in home health agencies. There are home health nurses, and this is not an exhaustive list of what they do, but um, who can do medication review and monitoring, patient and caregiver education. Um, probably most of you have referred people to home health nursing or home health physical therapy who um, can also do a lot of caregiver training. So it's a totally um, appropriate reason to refer someone to home health for caregiver training to use that lift that we saw in the previous slide. Um, there can be speech and language therapists, occupational therapists, social workers, um, and home health aides. And it really does take a team to meet the needs of patients at home. One limitation to the Medicare Skilled Home Health Agency, though, is that this isn't generally a long-term service. Um, people are qualified for this while they have what they call a skilled need, and that's usually only a 60-day episode, and then it ends. So. Um, teamwork is really important, though, uh, for these longitudinal interventions because the home-based primary care is really a commitment um, to being the primary care team for patients th through their end of life. The other two things that they found in terms of effective um, components, core components of effective interventions, were that combined palliative care with the home-based primary care increased the likelihood of dying at home and then combined um, VA home-based primary care with something called the REACH program, which is a caregiver support program, had greater impact on caregiver outcomes. So this is the last um, audience response question, and um, we'll take a moment to think about um, dying at home in America, where patients die at home. So thinking about um, the US, where do you think most Americans experience the end of their lives? Okay. 
Okay, so it looks like um, most people chose hospitals. So 73% of um, you think that most Americans are dying in hospitals. And this is actually what I thought too before preparing for this presentation. But actually, um, as of 2016, um, dying at home has surpassed dying in the hospital as the most common place of death. And this has been a trend that's been increasing over time. Um, this 30.7% of people in the U.S. who are dying at home um, is still a long way off from the 80% of Americans who state a preference to die at home. But um, it's headed in the right direction. One other thing to point out about this number is that there are a lot of sociodemographic disparities in honoring these preferences, um, with older white and male patients being more likely to die at home, um, and younger female um, patients who are part of racial or ethnic minority groups less likely to die at home. Um, interestingly, with some of the chronic conditions, um, cancer also increases your chances of dying at home, while having dementia increases your chances of dying in a nursing home. And having respiratory disease actually is the condition that's most associated with dying in the hospital. So um, there is a randomized trial that came out in 2017 of in-home palliative care compared to usual office-based care. And they looked at 298 homebound patients who had less than a year expected to live and who also had a hospitalization with an emergency room visit in the previous year. And they found that the patients who received in-home palliative care had a lot of um, improved outcomes, including satisfaction with care, fewer emergency room visits, fewer hospitalizations, and um, overall lower costs. And after controlling for age and survival, um, this actually was a 33% decrease in cost, which is even more than that 24% decrease in cost for home-based primary care that I showed you before. So one thing I wanted to point out, though, was that patients receiving the in-home palliative care, um, among them 71% uh, did die at home. And this is actually really close to approaching um, that number, that 80% of Americans who say that they have a preference of dying at home. Um, so that's pretty much the extent of what we know from published studies about how different variations of home-based primary care interventions affect outcomes. Um, there is not a lot of published literature about different variations of um, the care models, but fortunately there's more we can learn from practice. So that demonstration project I told you about from Medicare also included a learning collaborative where leaders from those programs got together at least once per year um, to share their experiences and lessons learned. And this list of core components of successful interventions comes out of expert opinion from that learning collaborative. Um, based on the sites in that demonstration project that had the best outcomes. So again, number one at the top of the list is teamwork, interdisciplinary mobile primary care teams. Um, also, that common theme that they saw in the literature view of coordination of medical and social services across the continuum. In addition to that, there's some best practices that are really important to be able to deliver an equivalent level of care at home that someone would receive in the clinic. And that includes 24-7 on-call medical staff, um, mobile phlebotomy, the ability to get imaging at home, um, the ability to have medications delivered to the home, the healthcare providers who are working in the home having access to the electronic health record, and then either the program itself offering transportation services or being able to connect patients with accessible transportation services when they do need to come in, uh, for example, for specialty clinic appointments. So we've completed our review of the literature and I'd like to take um, the last 10 or 15 minutes to tell you about the program design um, of home-based primary care here at UW. So the program itself just launched this past November, but the de program design process actually started back in 2017. And um, the goal was to customize these evidence-based practices that we know from the literature, that we know from the demonstration project, and make that compatible and to fit with our local needs here at UW. And in order to accomplish that, we brought together a lot of different stakeholder work groups um, to go through this population health um, program development roadmap. And I wish I could take you through all of the steps, but I did just wanna highlight two of the ones that I felt were most important. 
which was understanding the current state, really exploring, you know, who are the people who are working with the homebound population right now? What do they think the needs of these patients are? Where are their needs being met? Where are their needs not being met? And then how can we all come together to set some shared goals? And so in order to accomplish this, we had 29 interviews and seven focus groups representing um, patients and caregivers, UW health clinicians across the continuum, um, clinics, hospitals, home health, transitional care, nursing homes, Dane County community leaders, including the Area Agency on Aging, and then UW health clinical and operational leaders. And um, to summarize what we learned from the stakeholder interviews, we did essentially a qualitative analysis based on the SOAR framework. So some of you may be familiar with a SWOT analysis. SOAR is um, a strengths-based alternative to a SWOT analysis. It stands for strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and results. And some of the themes that came out of these interviews were that uh, UW and our you know, surrounding community has a lot of strengths that position us well, and we can really leverage them to have a model home-based primary care program in the country. Um, one of the most consistent strengths cited was how amazing um, our patients' uh, caregivers are. They're informal caregivers who are advocating for their loved ones every day. We have a really robust public health aging network here in Dane County. Um, we have a, a, one of the largest academic primary care networks that's a model for the country. Excellent specialty expertise in geriatrics and palliative care. And then um, we also have really unique relationships with uh, care facilities. So I, we will go to national conferences and leaders from other programs will tell me, you know, we just can't get the nursing homes to, to do what we want them to do in caring for our patients. And um, I think those of you who work with facilities here, I think we don't have that problem here. We have really great working relationships with all of our nursing homes and assisted living facilities. And then um, another really uh, core strength that was came out in a lot of the interviews was the importance of having um, such a great home health agency here, UW Home Health, which um, is now Chartwell, but is equally still invested into the care of all of our UW patients. Um, there were some opportunities highlighted in the interviews, places that we could improve. One of them was finding an invisible population proactively. So if these patients are not coming to clinic, um, how can we identify them? How can we find them before a crisis happens, before they come to the hospital? Um, how can we improve two-way communication between health systems and our community teams? So many of the people caring for these patients aren't UW employees. Um, you know, there may be home health aides. And then um, how can we improve access to mental health and dementia care? And a lot of um, themes that came out of these interviews had to do with the accessibilities of our clinics, including um, even just something as simple as parking for wheelchair vans. There wasn't enough. So I just wanted to share with you one quote from one of the caregiver interviews. Um, this caregiver, she was bringing her mom um, from an assisted living memory care to the clinic and said, our final clinic visit was a disaster. It was just me and mom in the wheelchair. We were trying to leave and mom had to go to the bathroom. I couldn't toilet her, so at the memory care, there's usually aides that will um, assist with toileting. She couldn't toilet herself and then they couldn't handle it. They told me to go down to a different clinic. That clinic wanted me to go and register at the front desk, totally not understanding that this was an urgent situation. Use your imagination, figure what happened after that. And it was not just a mess, but very traumatic for both me and mom. So the other parts of the SOAR analysis in these stakeholder interviews included asking about aspirations. So, you know, in an ideal world, what would be, we be able to do for these patients? And then results, what would success look like and um, how could we measure it? And so um, a lot of these things, I'm not gonna read them to you because um, when we hear about the actual program design, I'm just really amazed at how many of these aspirational goals that we've been able to incorporate into the program design and how many of these um, expected results we've been able to incorporate into the program evaluation. So I'll give you a brief overview of um, what home-based primary care looks like at UW right now. So as I said, um, the UW dedicated home-based primary care service did launch this past November. Um, the objectives of the program are to improve quality of life for homebound older adults and their families um, through two mechanisms. One is by increasing access to primary care, 
Um, two is by building home support networks. So really important to be both in the medical and social models of determinants of health. And you know, like my patients, uh, Evelyn wanted to make sure you knew connecting her with those home and community-based services really is the most important thing to her. Um, and then we have a pretty ambitious goal to reduce um, Medicare costs for the patients served by 24% and to be able to have a measurable impact on the quadruple aim. The eligibility criteria for the program here at UW is almost taken directly from Medicare's Independence at Home Demonstration Project. Um, we know that's uh, a, a high need at population here at UW and we can actually use the claims data that we have from our ACO to find that population, identify them, and do outreach to them. Um, so we don't have to wait till they're hospitalized to be able to find them. Um, the only modification we made to that eligibility criteria was um, the last piece here. For the Medicare Demonstration Project, patients had to have had at least one hospitalization with a post-acute care episode in the previous year. Um, we are doing targeted outreach to those who have had hospitalizations, but that's not a hard and fast rule because um, what we heard from our stakeholders is that we don't want to wait till a crisis happens. If we know someone's struggling at home, um, we know that they can benefit from the services. We really want to be able to access them upstream. Um, the other um, important thing to know about the program right now is that the initial areas that we're able to serve are on the south and west side of Madison that overlap with the Newbridge um, Senior Service Area. And then um, what does our team look like? So uh, we're very fortunate to be able to have uh, a really great interdisciplinary team and there's a lot of team members um, in the audience today. Um, a lot of people who are familiar with the home-based primary care in the VA ask um, me how our staffing model at UW compares to the VA. And so there is a lot of overlap, some similarities, but for the roles that we're missing on our core team, uh, we actually are, have developed partnerships or are in the process of developing partnerships to fill those roles as well. So in terms of physicians, um, we're very fortunate to have a lot of talented physicians um, working on our team that represent geriatrics, palliative care, family medicine, internal medicine, um, and actually also sleep medicine. We do have, similar to the VA, uh, nurse, uh, APP, clinical social worker, and medical assistant. In terms of um, access to physical therapy or occupational therapy, um, we're partnering with Chartwell, who've been uh, really helpful in delivering the care that we need to deliver to these patients. In order to get access to dietitians, um, we're working on a partnership with the Area Agency on Aging where a registered dietitian can actually do an in-home assessment at no cost to patients. Um, for pharmacists, we don't have a, a pharmacist assigned to our team, but we've been doing um, a lot of pharmacy e-consults, which is a fantastic service that we have here at UW, and I've been really impressed with the recommendations coming from our pharmacy department. And then we're also really fortunate to be able to partner with the Behavioral Healthcare Collaborative um, to have access to a therapist, the LCSW, who can do um, therapy in home uh, for our patients. Um, outside of the clinical team, I've been um, really amazed at how many people have come together from different parts of the organization across divisions and departments to make sure that we're able to offer those best practices to patients and deliver equivalent level of care to them at home as they would receive if they were coming into clinic. Um, this is not a comprehensive list, but just to give you some examples, um, we have a partnership with Chartwell where uh, um, the home health team will go out and draw labs. So if we need labs, stat labs at our visit, they can even be drawn within two hours. Um, the radiology department has been really instrumental in um, helping put together a relationship with a mobile imaging company where we can get x-rays at home. From the home, they can be directly uploaded into HealthLink, read by our radiologists, um, just like they were done in the clinic. Um, same thing, amazing support from the UW Cardiology Heart Station. They helped us pick out a mobile ECG machine. We have leads we can plug in directly to our laptop, get the tracing at home. Um, upload it from the home into HealthLink, into Muse, have it read by the heart station just like the ECG had been done in clinic. Um, we're also very grateful for um, our neighbors at 20 South Park Internal Medicine and all of the facilities and um, supplies that we're sharing, the backup system from the RN care coordinators and patient resources, 
And then also, um, I'm really excited that I think we may have the first interdepartmental call pool um, to my knowledge. So right now, our evening and weekend phone calls are being covered by geriatrics for these patients, but starting in July, we're gonna have a dedicated teamwork and it really takes a village to um, su support our, our patients. And so the um, uh, impact that we're able to have, uh, we're gonna be able to measure this we're um, really fortunate to be able to partner with Maureen Smith and the Health Innovations Program um, to do a program evaluation to see what impact we can have on the quadruple aim, um, looking for better outcomes, lower costs, improved patient experience, and improved clinician experience. So um, we're only at the beginning. We just launched the home-based primary care program, but we have a lot of future plans. Um, we're intending for this to be the first step of implementation um, of a larger strategy to fill gaps in the home care continuum. And this graphic just represents um, one picture of what that could look like, all the way from informal services provided by family members um, through skilled home health, home-based primary care. And there's actually a lot of evidence as well that hospital at home um, is a safe and effective model of care. And so we may be able to um, build on that in the future to deliver inpatient level care at home. So to summarize, studies of home-based primary care programs show improvements in patient and caregiver satisfaction, reductions in hospitalizations and long-term care placement, and reductions in total health care costs. There's the most evidence that home-based primary care programs benefit older adults with multiple chronic conditions and functional impairments, so those patients who would otherwise be nursing home eligible who are living in the community. And then the physician and advanced practice provider role um, is to improve access to the medical care and medical management at home in partnership um, with interdisciplinary team members and existing home-based services. So there are um, two, so many people to thank who've really contributed um, critically to the home-based primary care program development. Um, I just wanted to highlight um, the population health project teams that have been working on this since 2016 and the population health leadership advisory council who's been working on this for the same amount of time, um, particularly Dr. Trowbridge who's been a real champion um, of this model. So um, we think we have some time for questions. I just want to call out and say for anybody who has built things um, in this institution, the amount of detail and vision and planning that has to go in is extraordinary. Um, and you and your team have done an exceptional job and you're providing great care. So I am so proud of this program and everything part is part of it. So with that, questions? Yes. Uh, very powerful presentation on the advantages of home care. My question is, the scarcity of the um, home care team, uh, team providers. Who's going to be training these people? Uh, one of the things that we've been very impressed with is the scarcity of CNAs. The CNA scarcity, the CNAs are essential for home care uh, from my concept, mm -hmm. and the scarcity is severe at this point. Uh, what are your thoughts about who's going to be training these? That's an excellent question. Um, yeah, we can, question. oh, I'm sorry, thanks, Betsy. So the question was, what about the scarcity of the workforce? Who are we training to deliver all of this care at home? How are they getting trained? Where are we gonna find them? Particularly CNAs is a very scarce resource. And um, that's an excellent point. Um, I don't know that I have a solution for that because we can have a perfect vision, we can have a perfect program, um, but if we can't find you know, the people is really what makes the program work. And so there are um, a lot of initiatives, um, workforce development initiatives from um, the healthcare side of things um, in terms of national training programs to help people get trained in home-based care models. And we actually, I didn't talk about it today, also have an educational mission for our program and are trying to work with um, some national organizations to train interdisciplinary team members. Um, but to, to your point about CNAs, we've actually been focused a lot on the cl clinicians, but really what makes people be able to function and live at home are the home health aides. 
And um, I, I don't know um, that I have any solutions for that. I know we have some audience members who hire uh, home health aides and CNAs. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. I see uh, Sandy back there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's, it's working together. It's collaboration with the education um, element and, and the partners throughout the system and along the continuum. And being creative and cross-training works well in our environment. For example, we hire LPNs. They can do skilled nursing visits in the home care world, but they can also do aid visits. And that um, need for care in our acute world tends to go up and down. So I, I love to think about future collaborative things where Maybe part of the team is doing one kind of home care, but another part of the team is doing this other kind that more interacts with the, that in-between world of home-based primary care, which is sort of in between acute home care and hospice. Uh, one more question since we, have, yes. Do the majority of the patients in your study and your program have someone in the home for a caregiver, a family member? What about the patients who have no Oh, the question is, do the majority of our patients have caregivers? And um, I don't know the exact number, but we have patients both with caregivers and without caregivers. Um, I would say probably over half do have caregivers, but um, for example, the um, patient that I mentioned, Evelyn, um, is illegally blind and living alone. Um, she has hired caregivers who come three times a week um, from a home health agency. But um, I think if we look at this um, longitudinal study from the Health and Retirement Study, it actually does break down how many people are managing on their own. So um, the green here, these are people who um, are, don't have caregivers and are managing on their own. So that's a substantial group. Uh, we certainly want to support people who do have caregivers in their lives, but if they don't, uh, we want to connect them with the resources that they need to manage on their own as well, really with the goal of helping people be as independent as possible. Thank you very much. Any further questions, come up front. Thanks. That was awesome. Thank you.